Once again, we have Vincent DePorter on the place. <laughs> Hopefully tonight we're not going to be shut down by thunderstorms and all of that. So I think the last two times we've had him on, we've had technical difficulties due to uh, the node, or whatever it's called, uh, being shut down because of weather and blah, blah, blah. But tonight... We should be able to get through uh, this show. It's going to be wonderful simply because he's here. Yes, I brag a lot about him simply because he's a very honest person, number one, and he's so, so kind. And so before we go to uh, Vincent, uh, let me bring Daryl in. Hello, Daryl. Hello. Good to be here and really good to see Vincent. Uh, I always look forward to being around him and doing shows with him can't beat it yeah he's he's the kind of guy that you know we all need to hang around uh with that said uh let's go right to vincent welcome vincent well thank you for having me it's a real pleasure as usual and uh i really appreciate the show and uh, so i'm a fan so i'm always happy to be on well, thank you. Uh, you've been in transition for quite some time. When I first met you and we had you on, you uh, were very firm in one area, but it, it I taught on confirmation bias and how to deal with it this morning, but it, it, it appears that uh, you put what you confirm to the side simply because you really wanted to listen to many more things other than what you've been hearing because you grew up as a Jehovah's Witness and then turned mm -hmm. into, in a sense, a radical atheist, correct? Correct, correct. Yes, I I was a, a fundamentalist uh, a Jehovah's Witness and I became a fundamentalist <laughs> atheist. <laughs> uh, I was very... Uh, my my uh, ex-wife used to say you were a preacher when you were... Uh, a Christian, and you're just as much a preacher when you're an atheist, and it's true. I, I told her, uh, you know, character doesn't change much. Wow. But uh, but our opinions can change if we stay open. You know? That's good. Let's go back into your Jehovah's Witness days. Can mm -hmm. we do that? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Let's explore that a bit. Uh, what was compelling to you at the time? That is about the day, JW... Uh, let's say, framework of theology? Well, um, I, was, uh, I was born a Roman Catholic, but I was only six years old when my parents embraced uh, the Jehovah's Witness uh, religion or, or cult, depending on what you think about it. Um, but uh, in any case, I was brought up to uh, uh, understand uh, moral values, uh, the uh, example of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, there was a lot of... Um, I would say prophecy making from the Jehovah's Witness that kept me in, in check. Uh, they uh, announced uh, Armageddon being very close, uh, the war of uh, Jehovah God uh, against the uh, humans that don't uh, accept him. And so uh, there was a, a partly some fear, but also I have to say the community is extraordinarily uh, kind and, and, and nice. And so uh, I was, uh, I didn't have any reason to, uh, uh, want to go anywhere else. So I would say that uh, the beliefs and the, uh, uh, I would say the social interaction of the community was uh, enough to keep me in for a long time. Did you knock doors? I, I didn't endorse everything. I was 12 years old when I had some serious questions, but I learned very quickly not to uh, expose them to my father, especially who uh, was an elder in the congregation, a wonderful man, but uh, he was pretty uh, adamant about me growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, you know, and it makes sense. Right. Um, as a kid, uh, did you go with your parents, knocking doors, uh, knocking on doors, that is? Yes, I even did my first sermon when I was uh, eight years old. So Describe that uh, sermon. Uh, it was. I still remember it. I remember uh, comparing... Uh, uh, an old car to uh, to what uh, to beliefs and, and uh, uh, it's vague still but uh, I kind of remember that I had a, a lot of pats on the back for what I did when I was eight years old and I I eventually uh, gave more talks or sermons um, and um, I enjoyed it very much I I'm a little bit of a ham so <laughs> I was uh, enjoying the uh, being on the platform and, and giving talks but also I believed what I was saying. But I did have some issues 
but the, you know it's uh, you were talking about confirmation bias this morning and you know there's something to be said about shutting down anything that goes against what you uh, want to believe to be true so Certainly. that was my case um did you own a diaglot yes i did i had a diaglot i had also uh, the um um uh, what do you call it the uh the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, uh, the, um, oh, what's the name for that? Help me out. Uh, so I had the uh, uh, so scriptures in English with, with right. Hebrew on top. You had an uh, in, interlinear. Uh, yes, interlinear. Thank right. you. <laughs> uh, you know, the question to me is, um, what sold you on that particular kind of text base in Greek? And that may be a question that you can't answer because... Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they market uh, a particular text base that is of the Greek uh, that is extremely poor, but they yes. build their doctrines from that particular text base. You know, uh, people in higher and lower forms of textual criticism push it to the side simply because it's not, it's not useful. Uh, but the Watchtower Society, they really market that. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, I wasn't aware of any other interlinear or Greek uh, translations at the time. You know, they, they do a good job uh, keeping you in the dark because you are not supposed to do too much research, which would be a, a, a form of doubting. And uh, they pretty much um, demonize uh, inquiry. So as far as I knew, that Greek, uh, that uh, awful <laughs> Greek translation was the Greek translation I did not know better and uh, only growing up uh, and, and studying did I realize that uh, there was not just one uh, Greek uh, source that the watchtower pushed you know a lot of universalists get upset at me when I tell them to put their interlinears uh, in the garbage mm -hmm. can simply because um, if there's anything that's deceptive it would be what's called an interlinear simply because they are not a translation mm -hmm. uh, it the intention was at first to give uh, low rotors, people who don't understand the language, um, a gist, if you will, of mm -hmm. of where this could work from. Uh, technically, this is not translating at all, simply because it's simply using an English gloss system to compare to an, uh, a Greek term above or below. Um, but it's 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 what. Uh, it's what people do when they want to push doctrine rather than uh, process. Um, but so many people are sold on them simply because they can market their doctrines from them. It's it's confirmation bias, uh, nothing more. I sure. mean, you know, if you have a, uh, if you see Greek letters, you think, oh well, it's the original language, <laughs> and it's not. So uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, but you you don't know that when you're inside. You know the problem of of any. Uh, close-knit, uh, and, and I would say mind-controlled religion, is that they control the information. Right. Uh, you know, and they control what you look at on uh, the Internet, and they make you feel guilty if you ever go uh, beside uh, their own writings. So that's a, a clever way of uh, hiding uh, reality and, and what else is out there. One of the major selling points, if I'm not wrong, and please correct me if I am, <laughs> But it's uh, John 1.1. 1, 1, uh, yes. Because it's, it's very important for the Jehovah's Witness uh, team, if you will, uh, for them to articulate that Jesus or this idea of John 1.1 1, 1 is simply the word was a God. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's very correct. Uh, they consider uh, Jesus the Son of God, uh, but the, it's it's a funny thing though what you're pointing out because uh, in uh, the Jehovah's Witness uh, thinking uh, Jesus is indeed the Savior and they do follow Christ but they put all the importance on Jehovah the Father right or Yahweh um, they use Jehovah uh, but uh, it's uh, it's it's a little bit odd because uh, they go over what Jesus said. Like, for example, Jesus said that he was the mediator for everyone, for everybody. And now the watchtower is, uh, the governing body is considered the mediator between Jesus and the people. So that's convenient, but it's not biblical. 
So that's, a, that's why they call themselves the organization of Jehovah, as if going over the head of Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do most Jehovah's Witnesses uh, understand that the term Jehovah is a very poor form of Yahweh or Yahweh? Yeah. Uh, most of them uh, do, are, are, um, they know it, but they just uh, decided that Jehovah was it and that's it. Uh, if you talk with them individually, they'll acknowledge that uh, Jehovah is an is a invented name that has nothing to do with the Tetragrammaton, really. Um, and in their old, in older books, there was a book that was called Aid to Bible Understanding, and they acknowledged that. But uh, you know, it's like uh, it's like saying that you know, Chris, you know, to somebody who likes Christmas, that Christmas is pagan, even though they want to be Christian. As <laughs> it, it just you know, it's it, it flies over their head. It doesn't matter. That okay, fact does not matter. The argument that they make uh, that is about John one one, and and they're very dogmatic about it. In fact, all of their literature is all about this a God. In other words, they claim that. Um, the manner in which we should look at John 1 would be not was God, but was a God. And they put in all of their writings a little G-O-D uh, in John 1.1. 1, 1. Let me read this text because you've heard it a million times, but let me see if this makes sense to you. If I read this in our in Halagas, Kai Lagas, in Prastan Theon, Kai Theos, in Halagas, what I come up with... Uh, is many questions concerning what's being articulated simply because in the Catholic and Protestant communities uh, many people have looked at Caldwell's ruling which I dismiss simply because Caldwell was wrong he simply said that if you have let's say a predicate nominative that precedes an aquatic verb which you have theos ain and that's the example he said that it would have to be um, very much uh, rendered as being definite instead of uh, indefinite. Um, that is spurious. I mean, that is really spurious uh, work, and that has been falsified many times. However, the, the, the Watchtower Society, they have articulated many arguments simply because you do not have an article that is that precedes theos in this particular portion of the syntax, uh, which would indicate that we simply have a God. And I'm wondering if Jehovah's Witnesses really understand Greek simply because you have an article, but the article isn't necessarily uh, definite or indefinite. Um, no, what what determines whether something is definite or indefinite has more to do with context, uh, etc. For instance, the, the beginning of the verse uh, is in our and you have lack of an article, but they translate it as in the beginning, even though it lacks an article. And so it seems uh, very contradictory, that is, in what they're doing. But they have, uh, they have a, um, a goal. I mean, they have, they have, uh, they have to defend what they, they have been preaching for, for over uh, you know, 150 years, which is that uh, uh, Jesus is not God or is not a God. Uh, or he is a God, but he's not the God. And uh, they kind of dismiss uh, Jesus as being uh, as important as he really is. Uh, so it's all about um, a little bit fudging the, uh, uh, the translation there. And their new translation actually has some very surprising uh, changes that uh, obviously are not uh, um, original. And uh, you can tell they want to, uh, like, for example, they use the word homosexual in the Bible, things like that. But that they add in, add in. They, they just need to keep on, you know, um, confirming everything that they have said in the past, and and they do contra contradict themselves. So it's, it's very difficult, you know. I, I look at it today. I see my mother and my sister. They're still Jehovah's Witnesses. I love them with all my heart, and I know that the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, as people, are are, are rather really good people, uh, but. Um, they are misled by uh, you know a bunch of men that uh, have uh, usurped the authority of Christ. Basically, that's what they have done. Wow. Uh, let me make one other point with uh, John chapter one one for maybe some Jehovah's Witnesses who might be listening. Simply because if you look at this particular passage, uh, 
let's look at this anarchy in a lagos kai lagos ain pras ton uh Theon. Okay, Theon there is actually accused of. That's the reason that it's spelled that way. And then it says Kai Theos. So we have Theon Kai Theos. So we have the accusative with Kai, that's actually the conjunction, and then Theos, which would be the predicate nominative. The reason that the the only reason that the author of this actually put the definite article in front of Lagos instead of Theos, it's because this is a subject indicator. And so you need to know what the subject is in order to understand what's going on, right? And so yes. theos is not there suggesting, hey, look at me, I'm indefinite. That's not the way the Greeks thought. But to make something, and the reason that you would have um, theon, kai, theos, would be to make theos, the predicate nominative, emphatic. In other words, if you were trying to say that the word was really God, if you wanted that to stand out, you would say it just like it's written. You would say, Kai halagas ain prastan theon, kai theos ain halagas. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. I, I, that's the thing, is that you, uh, I have heard you uh, argue uh, John 1, 1 before. And of course, um, you have to remember that the uh, governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses are not scholars. No, um, not by and, and they, any means. And they, uh, they actually, the Jehovah's Witnesses do... Uh, uh, think they are scholars. I mean, you know, the first um, translation of the the New World translation was done basically by by France, uh, the at the time the vice president of the society, Watchtower Society. So um, there was there's no scholars. They will quote scholars uh, out of context to confirm what they uh, they say. Sometimes they get in trouble with that. Uh, they also do that with scientists. Um, so. Quote mining is their way of um, confirming that they are scholars, which they are not. And they're not saying that they're scholars, but every Jehovah's Witness I know, uh, faithful Jehovah's Witnesses, considers them uh, high authorities on biblical translation, which they are not. You've made some great points tonight. Now, what was the day and the time? I, I don't want you to tell me the date, um, but... Do you remember that moment when everything shifted for you from being a Jehovah's Witness into, let's say, this fundamentalist, uh, now an atheist instead of a Jehovah's Witness? Yes, it, it happened while I was uh, preparing a sermon. Uh, I wow. was preparing a sermon <laughs> on uh, the deluge, on the flood. And uh, I, I had lagging, I mean, I had uh, cognitive dissonance for sure, for years, probably since I'm 12, you know. Uh, but I always rejected, you know, how you confirm your bias and how you reject whatever goes against your bias. So um, I was preparing a talk, and I used to do pretty good talks that were well-researched, and um, it suddenly hit me. It hit me that it was just a metaphor. It hit me that it was an impossible story that didn't really happen, but that it had, you know, some valid uh, mythology in it, some uh, valid metaphors. But it hit me that all this time I thought it was true, and all of a sudden... It wasn't. It, 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 I, it felt like a ton of bricks. I still did my talk that evening, if I remember well. I'm not even sure. I, I'm not even sure I didn't uh, call in sick or something. But uh, I remember it hit me like a ton of bricks, and then everything just fell from that. It was probably in 19, in 2000, I'd say in 2005, 2006, probably. Wow. And I was very ashamed to, to talk about it because it was... Uh, it was basically apostasy that I was doing so. Did you feel free? Yeah, it's, it's funny uh, what you're asking, because I did have all of a sudden my faith. Uh, I fought for my faith five years after that, try to keep my faith. And at the same time, I felt incredibly free of dogma and of, you know, of, I felt free to look at the Internet uh, not right away, by the way, but uh, I started uh, looking at ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, what they had to say, something that is totally against the JW law, which is apostasy. Um, and I started doing scientific research more. I, was, I, was, I felt free that way. I felt free that I could actually inquire things, uh, read about things that uh, did not match absolutely what the Watchtower was saying. And until then, I was pretty much uh, blocked uh, of doing that. Uh, 
it's very hard to explain. It's you know, it's very hard to explain how your mind can be controlled by others, and you still think that you're an independent thinker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then you became this angry, if I can call it that. Uh, call you that this angry we'll atheist in a sense, right? <laughs> yes, you can call it that. I. Uh, I, uh, I had a big chip on my shoulder for the years to come because I felt I was uh, cheated. Um, you know, I felt I was cheated uh, not by my parents. I think, you know, they, they were sincere what they thought. But I was cheated by the organization, the Watchtower organization. I felt I was cheated because all of a sudden, I remember I never got to ask my dad. I said, you know, if we were born in, in India, we would probably be Hindu or Muslim. And then maybe you would be mad if I started looking at Christianity. And I, and I said, you know, I, I, want, I want so bad to talk to him about that. I couldn't. Uh, and he was sick, too. I didn't want to bust his bubble. Does that make sense? You know, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, try to figure things out. And I got really mad. I mean, uh, then I read The God Delusion. First, I read uh, the, God, uh, the Failed Hypothesis by uh, Stenger. Then I read The God Delusion. And then all of a sudden, I felt that I, I finally hit some reason there, and, uh, but I got uh, overly angry. Uh, now I look back at some of the Dawkins' words, and I, I think he's great when he talks about science. I'm not so sure he's that great when he talks about theology. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I do admire the man, and he did help me you know, bust that bubble. Uh, sure. So I, I, I will credit him for that, especially Dawkins, uh, Hitchens also. You know, and so I became a, kind of a Hitchens, an angry, <laughs> an angry <laughs> atheist. Yeah. I have to admit, um, when I watch Christopher Hitchens uh, challenge the Catholic Church, I was so proud of him. I mean, that was oh yeah remarkable. Yeah. And I'm I'm not an angry individual <laughs> at all. Uh, I simply am a compassionist. I, I love people, and it doesn't matter to me whether a person's a theist or an atheist, or something in between, or outside of the box or whatever. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that we love one another and and we try to understand each other. But you've moved from being that angry atheist because now you somewhat understand doxastic involuntarism in that your beliefs are not really your choice. Right. I, I, I don't think we can force anybody to believe anything. If there's an elephant in this room and uh, I can't uh, demonstrate it, uh, nobody smells it, sees it, feels it, then uh, you can't force somebody to believe it's there. Uh, and the contrary is true, too. If there was actually an elephant in the room, it would be hard to deny it. Uh, we don't, we don't, uh, I don't think we can force people to believe or disbelieve. I think we can only uh, show what we think is uh, true, and what we think is true is what we believe to be the case. And that we do in sincerity. What I have learned, what I have learned is to understand that everybody I have a, my default position is that everybody is sincere. There is no stupid theist or th stupid atheist. Um, there is uh, there's only people who actually believe what they believe. And uh, I mean, there are some people who are disingenuous, but I don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, by default, I don't see that. Uh, I don't want to see that. I want to believe that people are sincere. They believe what they believe or disbelieve, and we can go from there. Now, you've been watching this show for a long, long time. You've been on this show before uh, several times. I've always enjoyed you coming on. You're also a part of Philosophy of the Place, uh, which is a wonderful Facebook group, and I've seen you and Stephen Hoyt go back and forth. How did that change a little bit of how you look at things? I have to say with Stephen uh, Hoyt, we, we, we really butted heads for a while. Uh, I mean, sometimes we still disagree, but uh, overall, I have to credit him a lot because I, I have. Uh, it took me a while to understand where he was coming from, and I think he has a. I, th I think he's a great philosopher, by the way. Uh, I've read philosophy books that are way less interesting than his comments or his posts. Um, I think he's often right, uh, or at least it, it feels right what he says, and uh, uh, we we. Sometimes disagree because you know um, he he does defend theism. I don't accuse it anymore, but I don't per se defend theism. I, I, I think that I don't defend atheism either. I, I I'm just 
I, I would like to believe that what I believe is actually true, or at least uh, close to the truth, because, you know, what I know is very, very, I always say, it, what I know is uh, trivial. Uh, what I think I know is what I understand to be the case. And understanding is a whole other ball game. Uh, wow. Yeah, if you have something to say about that, you know, but you, you know what I mean. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. What are your thoughts about what Vincent is saying, uh, Daryl? Well, I have a couple, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> one thing is, you know, so many, I think, uh, don't even do as much research as as what he's talking about. And, you know, I, I'll have to admit I have an admiration for someone who at least attempts because, uh, you know, for uh, to be honest about it, most of my life, I would have never even thought that, uh, you know, any research into any kind of a Greek text or Hebrew text would be necessary. You know, I, I was naive enough to think that, you know, there was just one rendering of uh, what has been translated as the Bible and uh, people are honest and, you know, what you have is is a very literal, uh, good translation of, uh, you know, uh, in the English text. And uh, for some crazy reason, I, I don't guess I really gave a lot of thought to all the different English versions. And when I did begin to think about it, it was like, uh, well, uh, uh, this one says this translation's better, so it must be. You know, he was always relying on somebody else's uh, honesty and uh, their understanding, and I'm just the guy that benefits from it. I don't think that uh, this is uncommon at all, though, because you know, when you go in, generally, most people when they go in for some sort of surgery, if you're going to have an appendix removed, or if you're go they're going to work on your heart, or whatever it may be. Uh, you don't necessarily study and research as to how that's done and make sure they do it right. So uh, I think most people look at uh, religion in a very similar way. You know, these these guys are really smart. They've done their work. They, they're they not going to give me anything that uh, is not right. But unfortunately, it's never con seemed to be considered that there's all these different ideas floating around out there. And uh, How does anyone have a clue which one might be closer than the other? Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I think that's a good example, uh, the example of uh, the surgery thing, because uh, we, we do build our opinions, our, our journey on the shoulders of people that are more expert than we are. Uh, we trust our surgeons, we trust our priests, we trust, you know, we trust some of our politicians, maybe not that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, we, we have a tendency to uh, trust what we, we can't all go to college and be uh, have a master in everything. Right. So we do have to trust people, archaeologists, scientists to a certain degree. Um, I don't uh, fact check everything for sure. But uh, when I feel that there is maybe something to make sure of, then I will check it. Um, but I haven't almost all my life. I mean, I was in my 40s when I started doing that. Otherwise, I was exactly what you say. I was trusting the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then, you know, um, I, I thought they were more expert than I was until I realized that they weren't at all. Um, and that's demonstra demonstrable. Uh, so that's, that's uh, yeah, I think that's a good example. Right there. Every year I meet with many uh, Greek and Hebrew uh, scholars and professors from many different seminaries all over uh, the United States. Um, and it's, it's a bit sad, simply because the majority of them say, wow, I wish I could speak as freely as you do. But they keep saying, you know, since I'm tenured, I, I've got to stay with the format. And what they mean by that is they have to teach according to said doctrine, because if you go to seminary A, um, you've got to make sure that your graduates taking, let's say, Greek and Hebrew, pontificate the very doctrine of that seminary. That's a huge problem uh, is. that is within the context of the faith. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses are not the only ones who have this bias, um, but but the bright side is 
the people who really know their stuff, they're not in agreement at all uh, with what's being marketed. In fact, uh, some of the uh, Greek and Hebrew professors from even a fundamentalist school, and we have uh, Pensacola Christian College. I've talked with several of their professors many times, and one of them said, I can't wait until I retire. He said, I'm going to come to your studio all the time. He said, I love it here because you guys are open-minded. And the question of God is really up in there. We don't know that there is a God. But these people have to say things behind closed doors or they get fired. And I I understand that. Uh, and so, you know, they train for a long, long time only to... I don't know. It's it, that landscape is going to take time to uh, move, uh, if you know what I'm saying. It's in every domain, though. In every domain, you have um, opinion makers. If only we could put the cards on the table and acknowledge the missing cards. You know what I'm saying? We should right. have the cards on the table and say, okay, we we can we can make some deductions here, here, and here. Here, there's actually a card that's a fact that can't be, you know, denied. Uh, but we're missing this card, this card, and this card. Maybe more because they're missing, so we don't know how many are missing. And acknowledge that we don't know. You know, right. we have we can make an opinion upon. Uh, it, 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 for sure, if I say A, B, C, E, F, G, we can find the D. I mean, uh, there's some things that, uh, you know, it's like the famous missing link. There's no missing link. Every every bone is a missing link. Every fossil is a missing link. So uh, it's very hard to uh, be honest when we have something to defend. And that's true in politics, too. Uh, the moment we have something to defend, the moment we have an interest, then we can't really say we're objective. And uh, it's too bad. It's too bad that we can't put the cards on the table. There's so many things I don't know. Uh, do I have an opinion on it? Mm -hmm. But it's just an opinion. I just posted that on my Facebook. I have opinions, but they're worth what they're worth. Opinions. <laughs> That's not knowledge. You know? What would you say to people who are really pushing this Gnostic idea of theism and atheism? What would you say to both of those groups? That they both have the same evidence. <laughs> they both have the same evidence for a god, and they both have the same evidence for no god which basically means they have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so you like what I've said over the years. I said yeah. atheism and theism have nothing, nothing compelling. And, I, and some people don't get what I'm trying to nuance, but you do. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I, I, I can understand an atheist that says, well, there's no pr proof in fairies, so uh, why do we even discuss fairies? I understand that because I, I said it myself at a time, as you know. But uh, there is such a thing as uh, the anthropo anthropo okay I can't say it morphologic god, the one that uh, looks like a human has human characters and so forth, and uh, that's not the god that you're talking about. So nor is the, the god that uh, Stephen Hoyt is talking about, and so I get your idea better than the idea of uh, you know a god that uh, can pick his nose and you know scratch his feet. What are your ideas concerning uh, what I've said, what I've stated over and over again? That is, God is but an, um, God is but the abstraction of an idea by which we orient ourselves to create a functional society. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's uh, I think it's true about our evolution. I'm not sure that we won't let go of the uh, concept of God. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, I'm I'm just. I, I think you're right about how we evolved. We have created gods and metaphors and myths that help us understand what we could not discover by ourselves, what we had no tools for at the time. Uh, so we made up gods, you know, God of thunder and lightning, because we didn't know what thunder and lightning was. Um, I think uh, if we're talking about the biblical God, it's also a God that has, uh, I think, metaphorically helped us. Uh, in fact, I consider myself a bit of a you're going to laugh, but I consider myself a um, uh, cultural Christian. What I mean by that is I don't believe in gods. I don't believe in the supernatural ideas of man walking on water, talking snakes. and I think all that is metaphor and it's uh, poetry sometimes. 
but uh, I do believe that uh, I was brought up as a Christian, so uh, I do still recognize the value of Christ's teaching. I don't think he, you know, he died and went to heaven. I don't think that he, uh, you know, uh, made water and uh, wine and of water and and so forth. Uh, but I do see the value of his teaching, just like I I, I love Socrates and and Socrates. Sorry, I, I say the French way. Uh, Socrates uh, may not have existed either. I mean, you know, I'm not saying Jesus didn't exist, by the way. But I mean, so Socrates could have been uh, an invention of Plato. It doesn't matter. The message is still there. And I think if we follow good messages, good mythology, good metaphors, we are making the world a better place. But I'm not sure at one point we won't let go of our, of our, you know, like defense of uh, particular gods. I don't know. Let's go to SpongeBob for a moment. Let's quit talking about God. What has SpongeBob done for humanity? I think he made them laugh. I mean, at least some of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I like about SpongeBob, I'll tell you what I like. I, I, I was uh, very surprised. I was doing the Rugrats when I was called in in 1998 to watch the first unfinished three cartoons of SpongeBob. And directly I was like, this is not going to work because we are in an era where it's all it all has to be educational you know and uh we had blues clues dora you know you know things like that sesame street of course and um i didn't think it would work because it was too much what i used to watch bugs bunny in the 60s which was just silly you know uh sometimes even politically incorrect so uh, i didn't think it was going to work but i loved it so much and what i loved about spongebob is that he's a kind character unlike bugs bunny right right he doesn't prank anybody he believes that uh, Patrick is smart, <laughs> uh, so he's quite naive. I love that about him. I love that he's a nice kid. He's a, he wants to do good. Uh, he believes in silly things because he's just naive. And it was a refreshing character, and I embraced him from day one. So I was the first one to ink SpongeBob. Scott Roberts was the penciler, and we were the first one to ink him in uh, Nickelodeon magazine about a year or two before it was on TV, actually. So in a sense, these cartoon characters are possibly good for us, right? I think so. I think they're also metaphors, you know, uh, even when it's silly, uh, it, it does have a message of kindness when it, I think it's comfort. I think lately it's been changing a little bit, um, so I don't know. But uh, <coughs> the, the character of SpongeBob initially is one of kindness and naivete and, you know, uh, fun, just fun. Daryl, what are your uh, thoughts on uh, cartoons? Oh, they're devilish. Uh, you know, <laughs> Christian should not laugh. No, <laughs> and I've heard that at times in the past. But, uh, you know, uh, to me, they just help make life more palatable. I mean, uh, you, it's, it's just something to relax and enjoy. And, uh, you know, every so often... Uh, just the simpler things in life are what we need. Uh, just to be able to relax and say, you know, life's not that bad and it's not always serious. Uh, you know, uh, there's been lots of poetry about that. You know, if we don't have, uh, find time to smell the roses, so to speak, just to enjoy, mm -hmm. then life's going to pass us by. <laughs> you know? So I, I can appreciate it. Laughter is such an important thing. I think laughter is what can uh, de-stress us. It, what, it, it reminds us that uh, everything is not so serious. Uh, even when it is, I mean, uh, we laugh about uh, catastrophes. We, laugh, we laugh about death. I know my dad and I uh, would laugh about death, and my dad was on the brink of death. But he uh, appreciated the fact that he could laugh and he could mock it because that was, you know, his, his, the privilege of the... I think laughter is the privilege of the living, and yeah. I think we should take advantage of it. Uh, do you have any of those? Uh, I think you used to put on a pair of glasses or something like that and do a, oh, yeah, yeah. a bit of I don't, uh, comedy. I don't have them. I, I think I wait just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Gerald, go ahead and say something powerfully good while he's getting that. Powerfully good? Yeah. Uh, well, hmm. Believe it or not, I lost those glasses a long time ago. Oh, did you? And my teeth. I lost my teeth. I don't know why. I found some other ones, but they're not as fun. But, uh, but, uh, That's not good. <laughs> I, 
Yeah, I used to. I really miss them very much. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was looking forward to that. Wow. Well, I have a few things uh, because um, that's a kind of a SpongeBob kind of teeth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Those teeth are just fun. Um, I have to find a new panoply of uh, silly. I'm, I'm working on um, my stand-up comedy, so uh, I. Yeah, how far away from away from that? Yeah. I, I hope I, I can finish it this year, uh, the writing at least, and it's it's a lot of fun, but um, it's it's going to be a lot of preparation, and uh, because I want to add a few things like music and stuff on the background. So now you play the guitar, do you not? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I do. I'm not a great guitarist, but I play guitar. What kind of hey, guitar do you have? Huh? What kind of guitar do you have? Well, I have uh, both a uh, electric guitar and a, a classic guitar, um, not classic, but a folk guitar. The classic guitar, my son has it. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I feel right. I've been not, I've not been doing music lately, and it's too bad because I, I get rusty and I have to get back at it. But uh, I've been really busy with my second job now. I, I, I'm a child care provider for children with uh, special needs, especially uh, autistic, and um, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. The kids are just amazing, you know. Uh, so that's my other job. That's awesome. Final comments, Daryl. Well, uh, I was just fixing to say that, uh, you know, whenever we got knocked off the air the other night, uh, we hung around for a little while, and he gave me a little sample of uh, uh, what, uh, Vincent, you, you gave a little sample of what you're going to be doing uh, on your stand-up. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be interested in doing just a little bit? I'd love that name. I, I'll probably never be able to repeat it, but I, I got the biggest kick out of it. <laughs> I, I haven't uh, rehearsed it yet, but I can I can give you a little a little uh, excerpt if you want. Just a little taste, yeah. Uh, I want back to Dome to hear it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So uh, my name is uh, Igor Dan Van Poopendecki. Me 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 me. Don Klink Don Kozo Zoko Bagadu. I by Viktor Pavlovitsky. And um, a lot of people just call me. Hey, how you doing? And I say you could at least say my name. You know. It's not that complicated. It's Igor Dan Van Poopendekel and Duralini Minimink Bon Clinton Kuzdogo Bagadu. I have a Vicka for Ben Fritzinski. And but people kind of uh, think it's too long. I don't know why. My 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 grandfather, he came in this country and he shortened the name because uh, it was a big problem. He would uh, open a barber shop and then you could see uh, you could see in the barber shop uh, nothing because it said welcome to uh, you know Igor Van Poopen Deka do Lini Mini Mik Bon Klink Lankos Doga Bagadu I by Vic Lepper by Fritzinski and even covered you know the uh, the squirrel the squirreling thing there at the uh, barber shop so nobody knew what it was nobody came in so he lost his uh, business uh, but he had shortened the name it used to be a lot longer that's beautiful that's beautiful. It, uh, I, I do different voices, different characters, you know. I sometimes do a voice like this, you know. I do a voice like this. Well, what do you know, a voice like this, you know. Or a voice like this. <laughs> so That's powerfully characters. good. It would be a, a kind of a different stand-up where I do little skits where every time it's a different character. So it's not just going to be microphone and, you know, what's the deal with peanuts, you know, and stuff like that. It's just going to be a... A little skits, and it might totally bomb. I don't know. We'll see. That's really, really cool. I think so. <laughs> I've really enjoyed you coming on the shows that we've had throughout the years. Uh, I've always been impressed with you, and tonight uh, has been very, very good. So thank you for coming on. It's really made me feel really good simply because this week has been hell for me because my mother, roughly a week ago, she fell and broke her back. Inside the picture, you and so uh, just got out of out of the hospital actually, and what they did for her there was wonderful. And so I'm all about what science is doing for people. And so thanks for being on again. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're definitely uh, on this show. You've seen me evolve into another, you know, from one one corner to the other. But I appreciate and I appreciate the show very much. As I do the uh, the website, I mean the Facebook page. Yeah. Well, we love you so much, and you take care. We're out of here. Thank you. Good night. Good night.